Uh, nothing's normal about the picture. What's um, normal about any picture? <laughs> <laughs> but um, what you're looking at is Shirley, one incarnation of Shirley. When Kodak came up with color film um, and they had to send it out to the labs, of course, film can be printed in any color, tone, temperature. So they sent a little uh, slide, positive, with it, with what they called normal Caucasian skin. And they took a picture of one of the workers at the factory called Shirley, and uh, they distributed that with, to every lab across America. And they did that every decade, they updated the picture. And that's what you're looking at, the first version of Shirley. What happened was after, after the end of segregation in America, suddenly you had black children and white children in schools together. And so it was with original Kodak film, it was impossible to photograph all the kids in the class were the same, in the same moment. Because the black kids would come out very dark and the white kids would come out very light. And it wasn't until two of Kodak's big um, clients, the um, confectionery industry making chocolate and the um, furniture industry making things out of wood, they complained. They said, we can't photograph things that are brown. And in response to that, Kodak developed a new film that they marketed as a film that was good for photographing the details of a dark horse in low light. That was their coded term and hence the title of the show. Yes. So this film is um, famously Jean-Luc Godard, the filmmaker, termed it racist film. And when he was commissioned to go to Mozambique and, and uh, produce a film, he refused to use Kodak and used video for the first time in the 70s. I mean, w uh, what we were concerned about as well is the history of ethnography and its relationship to photography and its problematic relationship to photography and, and the one-way flow of power. And uh, Isaac Beshiva Singer, he's a Yiddish author, came up with a, lo a lovely term called nudnik, which he called, uh, in that term, a literary a a writer who was the center of their own attention. And this work is called nudnik, and if you look at it, we were in Gabon and we had two initiates from a tribe. Um, we took the picture of them and then they took a picture of us. And, uh, and that's called Nudnik. Yeah. yeah, so we were interested in this film that Godard had deemed racist, a film that couldn't accurately capture dark skin. And we managed to buy many rolls of this film. So this is a film that predates like the mid-1960s film that had been, hadn't been exposed, but we didn't know what condition it was in. And we took it on a trip to Gabon, to West Africa, and we went deep into the rainforest. Um, and we met there with a group of pygmies who were in the process of doing what's called a Bwiti initiation, where they take all the youngsters in and they initiate them, and they have to eat the eboga, which is this very rare root that is hallucinogenic. And it's a very, you know, it was a very privileged thing to be, to have access to that. But again, a very 19th century ethnographic pursuit, right? But we photographed it solely with this film. And we f used 40 rolls of film. We came back, and there was only one person who could process it all. And he phoned up several months later when he had done it, and he said, I've got bad news for you. There's only one picture that's come out, and that's the picture that you're looking at over there. And the reason it's so pink is that green pigment is very unstable. And over the years, over the decades, that pigment has deteriorated producing a very magenta colored, colored image. But we, we're actually not interested in the photograph. We wouldn't mind if nothing came out. What we're interested in is the performance of using that film in a place that, you know, that, that is the kind of ethnographic space. So you were not disappointed that no, the film No, we were delighted. What are we looking at? <laughs> okay, what we're looking at here is a model of the Polaroid ID2 camera. And it's a remarkable bit of equipment. Um, only because it was used by the South African government to make all of the passbook pictures. The passbook was a document that all South African, black South Africans had to carry and it contained a portrait and a profile image and this camera was developed for a number of purposes as well as for the apartheid government. But what makes it unique is that it's got a button on the back that's called a boost button which emits probably 40 or odd percent more light which makes the uh, black skin legible. And 
we came across a movement. Uh, there were two workers at the Polaroid factory, Caroline Hunter, who worked in accounts, and, uh, and her partner. And Caroline noticed that Polaroid in the 70s was earning $100 million. 10% was coming from South Africa. So they smelled a fish. And they realized that this camera was, if not purposefully designed for South Africa, was certainly being sold to it and was generating that 10%. So we took, we took this camera, we thought, what can we do with this bit of equipment? Because what interests us about it is the idea that a piece of equipment can somehow express an ideology or be a kind of carrier of, of, of ethics, in a sense. Um, and it really didn't matter what we took with this, with this camera, any image would have been political. It would have, it would have spoken about this history and this politics. And, we decided in the end to go back to South Africa where Adam and I both come from and we took a trip, a road trip around the country and we photographed um, in a way another kind of specimen because this, this machine is designed for photographing specimens. But what we, what we decided to do was to disobey the instruction manual because it came with instructions. It said always take por portraits and profiles. It said always position the subject 1.2 meters from the lens always make it in focus, always use the boost button on dark skin, etc. And we decided to disobey those rules and we came up with this. And we went on a you know, three week journey separately, but we had decided what images to, um, to take, which was turned out to be landscape images, really bad landscape images, because obviously the equipment's not designed for it. So. Um, so there you see each image is split in two. This would have been the front-on portrait, that one the side-on, which makes it very efficient, cost-wise, also very quick to produce an ID picture. You know, Alphonse Bertillon system. And, um, and what you see is, is what Ollie's saying, is these political documents that are also, for me, you know, this is a journey we took uh, as a child from Johannesburg to Cape Town every year as a child. And, I think they, they, they kind of uh, a little love letter, in a way, to, to, to my homeland. A, 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 a piece of technology in a museum, it somehow gets celebrated. It can't help but be celebrated. And I think to make a copy of it, somehow it's almost a ghost of it. And it's, it makes you ponder it in a different way. And I think if we had just placed the camera, it would have just been an artifact like you would see in the Science Museum, and we didn't want that effect. It, it acts more as a kind of memorial. And I think when you render it in a, in a different material, in porcelain, and it becomes this object that, you know, the danger is that you revere it, and we wanted to do the inverse. And somehow it's, it's yeah, it's quite haunting in that material, and its fragility, and its, and its, its uselessness. It, we didn't want it to. We didn't want it to be useful. We, you know, we finished this trip and we trashed those cameras. For us, this is—it's almost a kind of political essay, putting these two shows, looking at it like this, which is what Ollie alluded to before, which is that photographic material, be it film, be it a camera, can actually have a moral and a political value inherent in it, and it's not. It's not objective and it's not, you know, it, 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 it embodies these things and I think that's something to meditate upon. And for instance, what does digital technology embody? You know, what does a low res image mean to, to me now? And I think these are things we have to think through. I think when you pick up a camera it's a political act and it's important as photographers to look back and look at the history of photography and see how Authority and power in the state has always used photography as a tool, as a, as a form of control. But also to look into the future and to think about how new technologies are being used by used to control and, and dominate citizens. On that, on that note, we have a show up in Dubai which is using technology that is developed in Russia but hasn't been rolled out. And it's called non-collaborative portraiture. They place two cameras on the side of a door person has to walk straight to the door and it's captured your entire face. Or if you're in a march and you're walking down the street and you're obscured, by the end of the street you don't have pieced together your face. And it's incredibly ominous what this means. So we worked with the Pussy Riot and we worked with, and in fact we reenacted August Sanders' entire life work in seven days. 
using this technology. So photography is bloody dangerous. It's very dangerous, yeah. Photography is a weapon. Thank you very much. Thank you.